that's okay for me, but can we give it up for Jesus in this place today? How many are thankful for Jesus? How many are thankful that he loved you when you were unlovable? How many are thankful that he loved you when nobody else loved you? Amen. How many are thankful for Jesus in this place today? Amen. You may be seated. Well, are you feeling good today? That good, huh? That was a little weak. I said, are we feeling okay? Is anybody thankful that they were able to come into God's house today? Able to come to church today? You know, I was thinking this week, it's funny because a lot of times we think that church is about uh, making it to heaven. Right? I know I grew up, my parents didn't teach me this, but somehow I got this idea that coming to church was so that I could get to heaven. But I don't come to church to get to heaven. Amen? I pray, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior to get to heaven. But Jesus did say don't forsake the assembly because he knew that we needed community. He knew that we needed to come to God's house, to come into relationship with one another, that we did not need to go through life alone, that we needed to come together, to go through life together. Amen. I need, I need a little bit of backup this morning. We came to go through life together, to be able to reach others together, to be able to grow together. Amen. And Sunday is my favorite day of the week because I get to spend it with you guys. All right, actually, I'm being honest. I, I mean, I mean that. But I guess, you know, it may be my second favorite because, see, Wednesdays I get to spend the entire day with my wife because her and I both have Wednesdays off. Now, if you work on Wednesday, don't be mad at, you, mad at us because you ain't us. I'm sorry. But we work the other days. But on Wednesday, we get to spend the whole day off. And this Wednesday, everybody say this Wednesday. This Wednesday is for sure my favorite day of the entire month because not only do we have the whole day off, but we have first Wednesday here at Elevation Point Church on Wednesday night which is by far the best service that we have the entire month. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about because you ain't been here on a first Wednesday. Just act like you know you need to be clapping your hands. Yeah, first Wednesday is amazing. It is awesome. I don't know, but I've heard. But I encourage you to be here for first Wednesday this week. But, but you know, Wednesday is my favorite day. Sunday's a close second because I believe that you have to be able to lead your family well before you can lead anything else. If you don't lead your family well, and Wednesday I designate it just for my wife. We just spend time together, and then on Wednesday night, this Wednesday, we will come into God's house together and worship one another, worship with one another, and, and have communion. It's an awesome time. But this morning, I want us to look at 2 Kings chapter number 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4. If you brought your Bible with you, if you would turn there. If not, they'll be putting it up on the screen. But in 2 Kings chapter number 4, we see the story of the Shunammite woman, which is a fancy way of... I used to be like, what is a Shunammite woman? Like, what is that? But it's a fancy way of saying a woman that lived in Shunam. So the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 sees Elisha, who's coming through. The prophet Elisha is passing through, and she takes it upon herself to feed him a meal. Now, how many know if somebody gives you free food, you don't forget that, right? Like if somebody gives you a free meal, you're going to maybe pass by the same place again. Am I the only one being honest in this place? And so the next time Elisha comes through Shunem, he stops by the Shunemite woman's house once again, and she feeds him. And this becomes a regular thing. So she talks to her husband, and they build him a room on the roof of their house in Shunem. So that now every time he passes through, not only does he get fed, but he has a place to sleep. This is like the setup of all setups. They knew how to take care of the man of God. And so to show his appreciation, Elisha says, what is it that you guys need in your life? What is it that you're believing for? And the shooter of my woman says, I don't need anything. She's like, I got it all. It's all. She was well off. Her husband, they were well off. They had a house. Everything was great. Everything was working. She didn't need anything. But then Elisha's servant, Gehazi, opens his big mouth, and he speaks up, and he says, she has no children, and her husband is old. Come on now. That's fighting words right there. Like, like if I'm the husband, like you're going to call me out like that? Like, how are you going to question me right now in this place? But Elisha says to the woman, he says, you're going to have a son a year from now. 
Now, mind you, she said, I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I just want to bless the man of God. We want to house and feed the man of God. But Elisha says, a year from now, you will have a son. And she doubts it, but a year later, she gives birth to a son. He grows a little bit, then he's out in the field one day, and he grows sick, and they bring him to his mother, and he dies in his mother's lap. The promised child dies in the lap of the one he was promised to. I wonder if anybody's ever seen something that you felt was promised to you that died. Something that you were believing for that you were unable to see or something that maybe you saw but it didn't last as long as you thought that it would. And that's where we kind of pick up here in verse number 25 of 2 Kings 4, which is a very intense area to pick up in. But you know what I think? I think a lot of times in church, we skip over the controversial stuff. I think a lot of times in church, we skip over the things that makes people feel uncomfortable, which just gives an avenue for the enemy to come in and to disrupt your life when you don't know how to handle the uncomfortable situations. So I believe that there is there is power in the friction. I believe that there is power in the parts that we don't really want to talk about. Power in the parts that we don't want to think about. Power in the parts that make us feel uncomfortable. So this morning, I want to dive right into the midst of an uncomfortable situation where the man of God promised something and God fulfilled it and then it died. And it says in verse number 25, so she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when, she saw, when he saw her at a distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, see, he's smart. He's like, you're the one, this is all your fault anyways. You're the one that opened your mouth. He sends Gehazi and said, look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? And she says, everything is all right. But everything's not all right. Her son's dead. I don't know what planet that's all right on for your son to have died. But she says everything's all right. And when she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet and Gehazi came over to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. And she says... Did I ask you for a son? Did I ask you for this thing that you promised and just died? Didn't I tell you, watch this, don't raise my hopes. See, the Shunammite woman is is mad. Actually, I think think that's a little bit, I, I think that's the wrong word. I think she's hurting. I think she's in pain. I think she's facing sorrow in this moment because she didn't ask for this. Elisha offered it. You ever been given something you didn't ask for that came with a little tag to it that you didn't even want that thing? She she didn't even ask for it. Elisha offered it. And she told him, she even said, don't get my hopes up. It's impossible. I can't have children. It cannot happen. But then she became pregnant, which gave her the hope that it was possible. It gave her the hope that what she thought was impossible and what was promised is now possible. And I think that's where we struggle a lot of times. It's because we, we find these moments where, where the thing that we thought was impossible starts to come to pass. But I think if we're honest, that many of us would say that we find it easier to never get our hopes up. Right? Like, I'd rather never see a glimmer of hope than to be let down. I'd rather never see a possibility that it could happen just to have my hopes thrown down to the ground. She didn't didn't ask for this. She was just just feeding the man of God. She was housing the man of God. She wasn't asking for anything in return. It was an act of service for her. When Elisha volunteered that she was going to have a son. And now she's given birth to the son and she's watched him grow a little while and now watched him die in her lap. And I think that we would all agree that it's probably easier to have never had a son at all than to have had a son for a brief moment and have to watch them die. 
But the amazing thing about God, the amazing thing about Jesus is that that even in the midst of this painful situation, he was still working a greater purpose. Everybody say a greater purpose. He was still working a greater purpose. So for this week of Resilient, I want to talk to you on the subject, the hope in pain. The hope in pain. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. And I thank you for the powerful worship that we've already had in this place. But God, as we engage in your word today, I pray that you would just speak to each and every one of our situations. I pray that you would put me on like a coat and that you would wear me. Help them to see you and to hear from you because I know I cannot do this on my own. And I thank you for it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Now, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever bought something that that was expensive like a TV, a computer, a car, a cell phone and seen it break or get a scratch on it or a dent in it? Anybody ever had something expensive have something happen to it? Now, see, I don't know how you are, but I'm a neat freak. I'm a neat freak. I keep everything nice and neat and in order, and and I especially take care of things that I spend a lot of dineros on. You know what I'm saying? Things that I spend a lot of moolah on, I'm going to take really good care of that. Like, if it's nice, and I paid nice money for the nice thing, I want it to stay nice. I baby it. I baby all my stuff. I don't have a baby, so I baby stuff. I know I can't. Some of y'all are like, well, you can't take that stuff to heaven. I know that, but I'm going to enjoy it while I'm on earth. Hello, somebody. Take care of what God's entrusted you with and given you. And so I take care of my stuff, and I need, the thing I take care of the most, eh, it's my car. Second of all, first of all, my wife. Come on, I mean, come on, I got to get that away. But then maybe a car. I don't know why you're preaching right now. I got the microphone. (laughs) I'd say first my car, and then secondly, I would say my laptop, computer, Apple, MacBook Pro, 15-inch. Y'all don't care, but I do, retina screen. And and so I take good care of it because it's it's kind of my livelihood. I design on it. I write my sermon outlines on it. I do research on it. I Facebook stalk people on it. I do all this stuff. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Every one of y'all that laughed was a nervous laughter because you know you do the same thing. But I take really good care of my laptop. And how many know when when you have something nice and somebody else ruins it, it don't matter how much you love them. It don't matter how much you care about them. You get angry. Right? You get mad. And right before my wife and I got married, I bought this computer because that's when you buy things is before you get married. It's when you make your major purchase. Because see, before you get married, you're living off of ramen noodles. After you get married, every night is like a five-course meal with like Brussels sprouts and broccoli and chicken. She's going to make me live a long time, right? I was probably going to die at 35. Now it's probably bumped up a couple years because of, of my new diet. So you spend your money after you get married on the essentials like groceries and and like sweaters for your dog and, and that kind of, you know, important stuff, but not on computers that you need to make a living. And so, so I bought it before we got married, and, and not long after we got married, I, I realized that, that I needed a little bit of, I needed to maybe take it off, take it back a little bit on my care for my computer, because see, I had bought it and paid 1,200 times more than I normally like to spend, which is a dollar. So I'm like baby in this thing. I'm taking such good care of this thing. And I never let it out of my sight. But then we went on this vacation with her family for a couple of days, not long after we got married, to Chattanooga. And I took my computer in my backpack with me. Now, it's important to note the computer never came out of my backpack. I thought that I was more important than I am and that maybe somebody would need me to do something on my computer. That's why I took it. But nobody needed me. So I just left it in my backpack the whole time. And then I rolled into church on Monday morning the next week. And I took my laptop out of my backpack. My perfect, pristine laptop. And when I took it out, there was a dent in the bottom left corner. I was like, what the, he loves us. Oh, listen, that's what I do. That's how I, 
that's how I keep, that's how I stay holy all throughout the week is I sing in my anger. Some of y'all need to practice that instead of judging me for it. And, and so I got so angry because I'm like, what in the world happened? And I got sick to my stomach. I'm like, I'm not going to eat for days, which is a lie because I always eat. And I, I, but I was emotionally distraught. I was emotionally distraught. I didn't know what to do because somebody messed up my laptop and I didn't know who. Could it have been me? Sure. Was it? No. I don't know who messed it up. I never took it out of my backpack. I have some ideas. It could have been the unnamed family member that loaded the car in and out and put my backpack on the ground. It could have been the people at the hotel that put the bag onto the little buggy that goes up to the room. I don't know. But all I know is I was angry. And you know the first thing I thought when I, I can't tell you the first thing. The second thing I thought when I saw the dent on my computer, this piece of junk. And I immediately started trying to figure out in my mind how I could save up enough money to buy a new computer. Which is crazy. Because it still worked. I turned it on. I did my work. I did everything I needed to do. And everything was functioning properly. But I couldn't see past the dent on the outside of the computer. And I wanted to get rid of it. I wanted to just erase it from my memory and get a new one again. But then after a couple of weeks, I got to thinking, now I know which computer is mine. So we have a lot of MacBooks around the church because I heavily influence which computer choice we have. <laughs> so we have all these MacBooks, and I normally have to open it up to see if the login screen is mine or if it's, if it's the church's. But now I don't have to do that because I can identify my computer by the dent that's on the outside. I don't have to worry anymore. I can identify it by the thing that I wish was never even there. See, we go through the same thing in our lives and the same set of emotions whenever we experience lost hope. Whenever we face a setback, whenever we face a hurt, whenever we face pain, we just like to skip over it. We like to erase it, act as if it never even happened. And I know that what you're going through right now might be painful. I know that, that maybe what you've been through in your life might have left a mark. But the very mark that you wish you could get rid of, the very mark on your life that you like to pretend never even existed, the very part that you like to skip over is the same thing that God is using to identify you and to remind you of what he's done in your life and to remind you of all that he's brought you through and how he's been there for you. See, the, the Shunammite woman shows up in verse 26 and Gehazi runs out and he says, what's wrong? Is everything, what's wrong? And she said, everything is all right. And the first thing I need you to see this morning is it's all right. It's all right. Now, I don't have children, but... Don't make me have a five-minute prayer session to rebuke every single individual that just said that. I don't have children. We all acting up this morning. I like it. This is fun. I don't have children, but, but I would imagine that if I did and one died, my first reaction would not be, it's all right. Like my mom was inconsolable when I broke my first bone. I don't think that when your child dies that you say, it's all right. Now, I don't know. I, I, some of y'all in here are watching online. You might have experienced this level of pain before, and I can't imagine. I really can't. I cannot imagine. But no matter what level of pain you've ever experienced, no matter what level of pain you may be going through, no matter what you may be facing, the last thing anybody wants to hear in a difficult time is it's all right. I'm just being honest. Can I be honest for a minute? I'll preach in a second. Let me be honest for a minute. The last thing anybody wants to hear when they're facing an adverse situation is it's okay or it's all right. But that's kind of our go-to. It's kind of, in Christianese, we like to say, this too shall pass. <laughs> I know it's bad, but this too shall pass. And, and we're trying to be encouraging and we're trying to help people and it's got a good heart behind it. But everybody in here can attest the last thing you want to hear when you're going through a difficult situation is it's all right. Because it's not all right. 
Your life might be all right. You might have made it through it, but you've made it through. I'm still in the middle of it. I'm still facing my pain. I'm still having trouble walking right. I'm still having trouble fixing the relationships with my children that I messed up. I'm still having trouble trying to repair my marriage. And you may be through it, but it's not all right for me. But what's amazing about the Shunammite woman's story is she's the one that said it's all right. Which blew my mind. Like it perplexed me for a minute. Because see, if I were her son and I died and I went to heaven and my mom was like, it's all right. I'd be offended. I'd be like, God, you send me back down there right now. I got unfinished business. It confused me. Like, why, why is she saying my son is dead, but it's all right? It makes no sense. But then I realized it wasn't that she was saying she was all right with her son's death. She was saying she's all right with the one in control. And she knew that even when it's not all right, it's all right. Even when it's not okay, it's okay. Because it wasn't long ago that she couldn't even have a son. It wasn't long ago that she was marked with the disappointment of not even being able to produce a child at all. And she had seen God speak through the prophet Elisha and tell her that she would have a son. And she gave birth to a son. So it wasn't long ago that she had seen God move in a situation that wasn't all right. And she saw God move in an area of her life that she had written off as too late. That she had written off as impossible. That she had written off as never going to happen. It wasn't long ago that she had seen God move when everybody else had counted it out and she knew that with God it was never too late. I said with God it's never too late. With God, it is never too late. I don't know what dream that you've given up on. I don't know what passion God placed in your heart that you've written off because it's too late. I don't know what hope that you've lost hope in because you feel like you're just so enamored and so consumed with the pain of disappointment. But it doesn't matter how dead it looks. It doesn't matter how impossible it may seem. It does not matter how late it may seem. With God, it is never too late because time and delays and setbacks have never stopped God before and it's not going to start today. It's never too late. And it's still all right. I said it's still all right. Tell three people, it's still all right. She said, my son is dead, but it's all right. Then she gets, then she gets, to the man of God. And it's not that she lost her faith. I just think that mom started coming out of her. Because she told Gehazi it's all right. And we find if you keep reading the story, she still believed that her son would live. That's why she came to Elisha in the first place. See, some of us, when something bad happens, we just give up on it. When all we need to do is get into the altar and to pray and to ask God to move and to say, God, I know it's never too late. I'm not giving up now. She came where she needed to go because she knew that God could still move. But she gets to the man of God. She gets to Elisha. And I feel bad for Elisha. Maybe because I'm a pastor. I've been there before. Because God didn't tell, listen, God told Elisha she was going to have a son. God just didn't tell Elisha the uh-oh that was going to happen in the middle of the story. And, God, and Elisha says God has hidden from me while she's here. So God told Elisha she's going to have a son. He goes out on the limb. He prophesies a son. She has a son. But now God's not going to tell him that the son is dead? Because I'd have locked my door. If I'd have been Elisha, and I knew, I'd lock my door. Because a scorned woman whose son is dead is probably not what I want to entertain while I'm relaxing at Mount Carmel. Even though he really wasn't relaxing, he was doing ministry. But she gets to Elisha, and she says in verse 28, she says, did I ask for this? You ever feel like that? Like, God, did I even ask for this calling? Did I ask for this purpose? Did I ask for you to tell me that I would be able to do all this stuff that I clearly cannot do? Did I ask you for a son? 
Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? And the next thing I need you to see today is it's not all good. It's not all good. It's all right, but it's not all good. God is always good. I said God's always good, but that doesn't mean that everything that we go through is good. Everything that we experience, everything that we face is not good. It's unwise to think that the purpose and the plan that God has for your life goes on the path of least resistance, goes on the easiest path. That's what we would like, but it's not how God works. That's what we would want, but it's not how God works. And I think that the reason, because I thought about this a lot this week, I think that the reason that we find it so hard and so painful in moments of lost hope is because oftentimes they follow a moment of great hope. They follow a moment where we found out we're going to have a child. We found out that God was going to do something great. The Shunammite woman had seen moments of great hope. She had seen the impossibility of never having a son become possible. She had gotten a promise. Then she saw, she experienced that hope. Then she experienced the hope of a pregnancy. Because it's one thing to get a promise. We always want to see a sign. God said, I'm not going to only tell you you're going to have a son. Here's your sign. So now she's pregnant and she's experienced that hope. Then she experienced the hope of having a son. But now the son that brought her such hope is dead. What do you do when the thing that you restored your hope in is dead? What do you do when the thing that you anchored onto is dead? It hurts. It's pay- Some of y'all don't want to be real in this place, but it hurts and it's painful when you've had such great hope and it's been diminished. For anyone who's ever had the hope of a marriage and the joy of a marriage only to be followed by the pain of a divorce, the hope and the joy of financial abundance only to be followed by bankruptcy, the hope and the joy of a new job only to be followed by a pink slip, the hope and the joy of overcoming the addiction that you fought for all those years only to see the temptation bring you back into the pain and the torment of being where you always were. It hurts, and it's heavy, and it's painful, and there's friction. The hope and the joy of leading 28 to 3 in the Super Bowl, (laughs) only to lose 31 to 28. Too soon? I don't know, maybe. But it hurts. And it's painful. And for many of us, it's the hope that we once had that makes the situation that we're facing so painful. It's the hope and the joy that we once had and the things we were able to do and the things that we were able to see that we don't see right now that makes what we're facing so unbearable. Because right now, it's not good. It's all right. But it's not all good. God is still good, but what I'm facing is not good. See, for the Shunammite woman, she would have skipped over the pain of her son dying. She would have skipped over this part. She would have skipped over having to see her son lay on her lap. Can you picture this? And die in the midst of herself. She would have skipped over that part. But that had to happen to bring her story full circle. That had to happen to get her where God was trying to take her. I know that what you're going through might be painful right now. But what if I told you the very thing that you wish you could erase, the very thing that you wish you could act like never existed, the very thing that you cry yourself to sleep at night, the very thing that you don't even talk about, the very thing that you tried to pretend like it's not there was the exact thing that God was using to bring your story full circle. What if I told you that the very thing that you hate so much was the very thing that God was using to get you where you needed to be. 
the Shunammite woman would have skipped over her son's death. I think we can all agree she would have skipped over her son's death. But his death, just like his birth, was a setup for a miracle. His death, just like when she found out he was going to be born, was equally as miraculous. It was equally setting up for an equally powerful miracle. And I know most of y'all, most of y'all are thinking I'm talking about when he came back to life. Right? Because Elisha goes in, he does some weird stuff. He like lays on the boy, blows on him mouth and stuff, and he prays and he does all this weird stuff. And he's praying and, and then God raises the boy. And that's the part, that's, that's so good. You're not excited about that. The boy came back to life. My God. He was dead, but now he's alive. But some of y'all think that's the miracle I'm talking about that his death was a setup for, but it's not. That's not, that's not, the, that's not the miracle. It was good. It was fun. It was cool. But that's not, that's not the, the purpose of why he died. It's not the purpose of why the Shunammite woman had to experience what she did. There was a, a bigger picture. Tell somebody there's a bigger picture. What if I told you that it had nothing to do with his resurrection? What if I told you his death had nothing to do with the preparation for him coming back to life? See, we always focus on the immediate. We always focus on what we see right now. I'm in pain right now. I'm hurting right now. Things aren't working right now. I don't like my life right now. My marriage is miserable right now. My children won't listen right now. And then we focus even on the immediate miracle. When the son came back to life. But it wasn't even about that. Last thing I need you to see this morning. It's not about now. It's not about now. What you're going through today has nothing to do with who you've been in the past. It has everything to do with what you will do in the future. It has everything to do with what you will see in the future and what God is going to do in the future. Because the Shunammite woman's story did not end with her son's death. But it didn't end with his resurrection either. The Shunammite woman's story was a lot like dad's sermons. It had, how many closings? Three closings. The Shunammite woman's story had three closings. It had the first where she fed Elisha and she housed Elisha and Elisha gave her the promise of a son. That's one part. Then part two, second closing. We see that the son dies. She goes and gets Elisha. Elisha prays and the son comes back to life. That's the second closing. And that's the parts that we always talk about. That's the parts that we always enjoy. Those are the great things. Those are the fun, exciting things. But, but her story did not end in chapter 4. Her story did not end in chapter 4. Some of us have mistaken the end of a chapter as the end of our story. Some of us think that the end of what, what we're facing is the end of our life, but it's just the end of our chapter. It's not the end of our story. She's been through a lot, but it wasn't the end of her story. Your divorce might have been the end of a chapter, but it's not the end of your story. Your financial setback might have been the end of a chapter, but it's not the end of a story. Your younger years might be over, and it might be the end of a chapter, but it's not the end of your story. I said it's not the end of your story. The diagnosis that the doctor gave you might be the end of a chapter, but it's not the end of your story. Your career setback might be the end of a chapter, but it's not the end of your story. Her story did not end in chapter 4. She comes back on the scene in chapter number 8. And it says in verse number 1, Now Elisha said, had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can. Because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. And the woman proceeded to do as the man of God said. And she and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines seven years. And at the end of seven years, she came back from the land 
of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house and her land. She forfeited her land. She forfeited her house because Elisha told her famine's coming and you need to go. So she left where she was and gave up what she had. But in verse 4, the king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, Elisha. And that said, the king had said, tell me about all the great things that Elisha has done. Look at the timing of God. You think God's late? God's not late. God's right on time. She, Gehazi is standing there talking to the king about Elisha's miracles when the Shunammite woman shows up. And it says in verse 5, just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life. Restored the dead to life. Restored the dead to life. The woman whose son Elisha brought back to life came to appeal to the king for her house and her land. And Gehazi said, that, that's the woman. That's the, that's the one I'm talking about right there. He says, this is the woman, my lord, the king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. At the very moment that Gehazi was telling the story that she wanted to erase, at the very moment that Gehazi was talking about how she wanted to get rid of the death of her son, she walks in with her miracle, her son, and she's standing before the king. But it's not over yet. Because it says the king asked the woman about it. And she told him, then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, give back, give back, give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day that she left our country until now. Everything that she had left and everything that has been while she's been away. But follow me here. Follow me, follow me. If she never fed and housed Elisha, she never got a promised son. If she never got pregnant and had uh, the baby, then he never would have died. If he never would have been born and died, then Gehazi would have never been telling her story to the king. And if Gehazi would have never been telling her story to the king, the king never would have given her land and the income from the seven years that she was never even there. I know you may not like what you're going through. I know that it may be hurting. I know it might be painful. But it's not the end of your story. It's not over for you. God's not through with you. God's not done with you. There is hope in your pain. There is hope in your struggle. There is hope in your setback. If you've been knocked down, if you've been knocked down, I don't care how long you've been down. I don't care how long you've given up. If you've been down, you got to get up and dust yourself off because your story is not over. God's not through with you. He's taking you somewhere. He's leading you somewhere. And there is hope in your pain. Stand to your feet all over this place this morning.